And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable, because he was nigh to Jerusalem, and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, my text, Occupy till I come. May we pray. Holy Father, give us to see the unbelievable blessing thou hast bestowed upon us by saving us from our sins when the majority of the people in the world not only are unsaved, but the agony is that they may never even hear the gospel. Why? Why? Why didst thou put the finger of thy calling and election upon us? We thank thee for it. And then with a world of Christians, hundreds of millions of them to be sure, why thou didst call us out of the rank and file of Christendom and given us the burden and the responsibility and the privilege and the opportunity of doing extra special service in thy name for thee, thy church, thy kingdom, and for the souls of men we do not know. But we're afraid of it. Always that comes to our minds the cry of the greatest of us all, St. Paul, when he pleads, who is sufficient for these things? And then we thank thee that by the Holy Spirit he answers himself and us when he says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. We have the same Christ, the same Spirit, the same burden, the same responsibility. Help us to live up to it as he did in the Christ's name, gratefully, with thanksgiving. Amen. You know, when it comes to sowing, preaching the gospel, whatever you want to call it, we're in the greatest business in the world, aren't we? There's nothing to compare with it. First of all, I'm talking from the practical standpoint, not from the spiritual so much. Think of it. It has more people involved in that business than in any hundred businesses in the world put together. There are multiplied tens of millions of Christians around the world, small way, big way, much, little, who are engaged as we are in trying to win the lost to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then here's a business that has branches in all the world. There's no place on the face of this earth where this soul winning business is not known. Then there will never be in that business the warehousers cutting down on the lumber business and firing a bunch of people. We need more and more and more. And then may I talk Jewish to you for a little while. What about the reward? You laugh. You laugh, all right? Laugh loudly. Supposing... The Archangel Gabriel were to put down right here a blank certified check for ten million dollars so you could fill in your name and cash it in any bank and put one, one, 
one lost soul on this side and ask you, you can have the 10 million or you can have the lost souls. Soul living. How many of you would turn down the 10 million and win that soul for Jesus Christ? Let me see your hands. I would. I wouldn't give him a chance to change his mind. The rest of you didn't understand the Jewish phraseology. That's all. But you'll catch it a month from now and start maybe using it in your preaching. But let's go to this text. While Brother Tippett was preaching, there came to my mind a story that's as true as anything in the Bible. In Germany, I think in Hamburg, but I'm not sure. There was a man, our kind of Baptist, called Gerhard Unken, was against the law to preach the way he did. He was arrested again and again and again. Finally, the magistrate, the judge, got angry with him. He stood up and waved his finger at Gerhard Unken and said, My Herr Gerhard, as long as I can wag this finger, you're not going to preach. I'd like to have been there when Gerhard looked up into the judge's face and said, Your Honor, as long as I can see God above that finger, I'll keep on preaching. That's what... That is what you need in the Northwest. You act like you're whipped. You say, it's hard. I've been in every principal city, from Vancouver to San Diego, every one of them, big, little, in between, and some of them more than once. I know what you face. But supposing I were to ask you, how many of you believe that the Northwest is too hard for God? Raise your hands. I'd like to see. How many of you believe the Northwest is not too hard for God? High. Real high. Stretch them. Turn around and look. Keep them up. Keep them up. I'm not through with you. All right? Where are... Keep them up. I'm not... Be, where are their excuses, Claude? Too hard. Thank you. Too hard for... Whom? Too hard for us, yes. The most spiritual city or town or countryside in the Bible Belt, the most spiritual, is too hard for us. And the furthest away from God community here in the Northwest is not too hard for God. And we're fighting God's battles and doing God's work so. First, the objects to hold in view. Occupy till I come. The objects to hold in view. First, our own personal piety, our own personal righteousness, our own personal holiness, our own total abandon. Constant, ceaseless, endless, every day, every time we think of it, surrender to the Lord God Almighty. Then our families, right with God, knowing the family altar, knowing the peace of God that passeth all understanding, knowing the prosperity that can only come from God. Then our churches, citadels of truth, blazing, burning, inviting instruments in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And then souls, 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 endless souls coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. You marvel how men at my age can keep on going. I'll tell you the secret, and I won't charge you a thing. Here I am preaching a sermon, a Jew, and no collection. Man alive, 
You need, now you stand a chance. You're change, get him to change it and quickly. But look, you get tired, you get worn, your nerves crack. Mine do. Just about the time you come to the end of your rope, just about the time the knot is beginning to slip at the end of the rope, the power of God comes down on a congregation and there's a flood of souls in response to the invitation. And brethren and sisters, that's vitamins that even squibs has never discovered yet. That's not B12, that's B1200. I preached in this church, in this four square church, when the great Jeffries was the pastor, but not this auditorium, and the old one. And thinking about it, thinking about what happens when you see a flood of souls, I wish I were Pentecostal for about two, three minutes. Oh, man! Oh, man! See those souls respond to the invitation. Sit there in that front pew as I did Sunday night and see Jack Stewart baptize one, another, 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 one big husky fella. I thought the water would spill over and splash the choir. He was so big. Man, the second thing, the obstacles that we are going to face, you'll never get away from them. Wait, that's not true. I can tell you how to get away from obstacles. I can tell you how to get, get away from difficulties. I can tell you how to get along with a minimum of trouble. Just don't do nothing. I know, I know you English purists. I should say don't do anything, but just don't do nothing. That's all. Just don't, don't do nothing. Ever hear the story about that Negro slave in the antebellum days was out in a boat on a duck hunt with his master. The Negro was a lay preacher in the Methodist church. The master was unsafe. The master said to him, Reuben, here you are, Christian, I'm unsafe. He said, how come the devil leaves me alone and you're always complaining that he bothers you? The black man said, you're not going to hit me if I tell you? I won't touch you. Tell me. Well, the Negro said, when you shoot into a flock of birds and kill one and wound the other, after which one do you send me? The boss, the master said, why, after the wounded one, the dead one will be right here. The Negro looked at his master, got serious. He said, master, you done answered your own question. You is dead. Me as a fluttering. That's the way, yeah. Keep on fluttering. I'm old enough to give you advice. Preachers, deacons, Sunday school teachers, keep on fluttering. And the more you do for the Lord, the more obstacles you'll have to face and overcome. It's the dead ones that the world, the flesh, and the devil leave alone. Now, what are those obstacles? First, personal weaknesses. How you feel about it, I do not know. But I've come so far short of the standard I've set for myself that I'm literally sick when I think of how far short I've come of the standard that God has set for me. Our personal weaknesses. I heard the mighty George Truitt, the, the greatest preacher that I ever heard in these years, that I've been a Christian, say to us, pastors in Dallas County, 
He said, you don't know how every Monday morning I want to resign from my church. The agony in it. The shortcoming. Oh, God, if I'd have said this, if I'd have done that, if I'd have preached this, that personal weakness. Then what shall I say about the indifference of our church members? The coldness of them. And how many of them can we count? May I tell you a story again? That's all I know. I'm not going to tell you the name of the church and the names of the preachers for obvious reasons. At that time, the church had 36,000 members on its rolls. I know. I've held 11 revivals with that pastor in that church. And one of my friends is going to glory. An evangelist was seated on the platform. He turned to the pastor. There was the auditorium with more than 3,000 people in it. Now it's 6,000. He said, call him by his first name. He said, if you lose a hundred of your best people, you'll be hurt. The pastor made his voice deep. I've heard him do it when he's moved. He called the evangelist by his first name. He said, you're wrong. If I lost ten of my best people, I'd be ruined. God in heaven. Thirty-six thousand people on the road. We talk about Jack Hiles and Jerry Falwell and and Bob Gray and and Tom Malone and and Bailey Smith and and Jackson and all the rest of them. And how many of their people can they count? It's a universal problem. But remember, my brother preacher, remember my brother worker or sister worker. They need us. They need us. And when we are needed, we ought to be happy. They need us. There's never been a generation of Christians on the face of this earth that needed us Christian workers as badly as this generation does. They're under pressure, awful pressure. And we've got to be kind to them. Then what shall I say? about the obstinacy of lost souls, for want of a better word. They act as though they were not concerned. They act as though they had no souls. <laughs> they act as though there's no heaven, no hell, no God, no Christ. It's enough to break the heart of a stone statue. But have you fathers, have you mothers, ever fed medicine to your babies when your baby fought you and you had to hold its nose to make it swallow it and the baby took a slap at you and said, I hate you, I hate you. All right, you got mad at the baby and threw it in the trash can. No, you didn't. <laughs> you loved it so much the more. You see, I'm as convinced as I am that I'm preaching to you that every unsafe person on earth is demon-possessed. There are no empty hearts. And it's the demon in them that's talking, and not they. Have you ever had an unsafe person that you couldn't win for Christ say to you, I got nothing personally against you? I like you, but I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not something else, but let's go on. It would take me a lot of holding back to keep from pouring up what's on my soul to help you. Third, the allies that we may count on. Not only the ob objectives to hold in view, 
not only the obstacles that we are going to face, but the allies on whom we can count. First of all, there's the interest of the Father. As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no joy in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked might turn from his wicked way. Turn ye, turn ye, for why will you die? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God and our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God is not slack concerning his promises. Men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Then we have the investment of the Son. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. The investment of the Son in that blood that we have been impressed with by everyone who has spoken thus far this morning. The investment of the Son, if God will not honor us, he'll honor the blood of his only begotten Son. Then the intercessions of the Holy Spirit, of whom Paul tells us he maketh intercession for us, with us, in us, by us, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Then the inspiration of fellow Christians. I have never been in a church, and I've been in all sorts and all kinds of them, modernistic, liberal, fundamental, all kinds of denominations and so on, preaching. I've never been in a church that did not have some people in it that were ablaze and aflame with longing to see souls come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember how the Lord encouraged Elijah when he said, I have 7,000 people that have not yet bowed their knees to Baal, but we have seven million people, and then we have, we have more than that right here in the United States of America who are concerned for the ongoing of God's kingdom and the building up of his church. And then, of course, not only these, but what about the fact that we have the Bible, the Word of God. Think of what I'm saying to you. Like a hammer, like a sword, discerning the thoughts of man, never supplanted, never replaced, attacked as not all the books in Christendom and outside of Christendom have ever been attacked. And still, this blessed Bible the sword of the Spirit. And then what shall I say about the ally of prayer? What do you say? Here we are, January 19, 1982. What do you say, friends? You and I, all of us together. Clyde, am I asking him too much? What do you say that we dedicate ourselves this year to a year of prayer such as we've never spent in any year of our lives before. See what God can do in answer to prayer. Johnny Bissanyu, who was my song leader for almost three years, talked to his people, and he wants them to raise $10 million in the next two years for more buildings and he says that he wants them to double their ties. Well, I'm not asking you to raise money. I'm not telling you to raise money, but will you take up the challenge from me right now? How do you know that God answers prayer in the Northwest? You say you're stuck. How do you know he answers prayer? Give him a chance. We had a professor in the seminary. Some of you knew him. 
Dr. B. A. Corpus, who said, and I wrote it in my Bible then, pray when you feel like it. Pray when you don't feel like it. Pray until you do feel like it. Ooh, that man must have had you blood in him. He was so smart. Pray when you feel like it. Pray when you don't feel like it. Pray until you do feel like it. There are enough people right here without an additional person, and there are plenty others in the Northwest who join us who can force God to perform miracles right here in this Northwest area. He will take hold of me. He likes to be compelled. But let's go on. What about the victories that we shall achieve? You notice I didn't say the victories we might achieve, the victories we may achieve, the victories we hope, no, the victories we shall achieve. With my hand on this book, I wept over this message. Before God, I assure you, in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, if you'll do nothing else, Except take my challenge to pray, you'll be a different person the next time you come to the evangelistic conference. What victories? First, in our own personal lives, the power of God upon us. In our own personal lives, the magnetism of the Holy Spirit to draw people into our churches then souls won, an increase in baptisms. Listen, I know I've been a, a Christian 57 years this coming March. I've been a preacher of the gospel 52 years. I've been an evangelist 37 years this May. Uh, wait a minute. I've been in Angeles 47 years. This may, I ought to know something about it. You want more souls? You want your baptism of waters troubled? You want the Sunday school to increase? Begin with God in prayer. That's where it starts. Will you say amen to that? That's where it starts. And that's not asking too much, except to say this to you. If you're going to wait till you have time for prayer, you'll never pray. You've got to make time. You've got to take time out of something else. You can't. You're busy. I know. And then Satan will be defeated. And the Lord Jesus Christ will be crowned and glorified. And this entire area which is our responsibility, yours more than mine because you live here, will know the impact of the gospel. So, let's go on and finish. The plan we are to follow, the program we are to follow, it's easy enough for me to stand up here and out of the ache of my heart pour myself out upon you and say this and that and the other thing, but what about a program? What about a plan? After all, if you forgive me for mentioning it so often, I'm a Jew, and Jews are a practical people. But a typical understand that word, so will some of you. They're not loofed mentioned. They're not cloud men. Their heads are not in the clouds. If they are, their feet flat-footed are right here on the ground. And here's the practical of it. First, in your concern, in your troubled minds, in your fear and doubt and misgiving, in the pressure, I know, I know I'm not a Johnny come lately. I'm not stupid. I know some of you are under pressure financially. And in other ways, my heart goes out to you. I know, I know. I know I'm reaching into your hearts. Remember what God 
has done in the past. Remember what he's done across America. Remember what he did for a while in Asia. I got a letter last week from the Ukraine. The Ukraine! From the Ukraine. They won't know when I was coming. They say a revival has broken out in the Ukraine. Man, I had to pinch myself and reread the letter to see if it, what God has done. What God, he's still in the business. He's never surrendered. He's never retired. He, remember what God has done. Look to the rock once you are hewn, and the hole of the pit once you are dig. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah who bore you. Look what he's done for you personally. What he's done, you ought to come up here and where we are, and look at yourself. You're prettier than the prettiest garden with your clean faces and nice clothes on. God, God, God has been good to us. Our lines have fallen. Look what he's done. You've, you've not labored in vain. You've not preached in vain. You've troubled the baptismal waters. Your Sunday schools have grown. Your churches have grown. Your finances have grown. Oh, maybe you didn't do as much as Bailey Smith did or Adrian Rogers or some of the rest of them, but don't despise the day of little things. God's been good to all of us. Then second, not only remember what God has done in the past, but realize now how much there's yet left to do. We're the most fortunate generation of Christians. I repeat, there never has been a time when there's many people to be reached for the Lord. I know it's hard, getting more and more difficult all the time, but men have said infinitely wiser than I am. If you want your life to be happy, if you want it to count for something, Find a great cause and invest it in it. What can be a greater cause than the work of the Lord? What can be a greater cause than the building up of the churches? What can be a greater cause than troubling the baptismal waters? What can be a greater cause than adding recruits to the army of the Lord Jesus Christ? What can be a greater cause than fighting Satan. What can be a greater cause, a greater cause than exalting and glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ? And then third, not only remember what God has done in the past, not only recognize how much there is yet left to be done, but remembering especially the allies that I've told you about resolve that from this hour on out you're going to major on majors and not on minors. You're going to put God to the test with your own personal lives. Forget about the Achans. Let him rock wherever they are. I've said this over and over and over again. Ami, Mahmoud, the Amun of Slamo. I believe with the faith of a Solomon that if every member of your church were hell on ball-bearing wheels and you were right with God, we were right with God, we'd win souls. It's a personal matter. What do you say? I repeat, as I've said again and again in this humble outpouring of my soul, please God to your souls, that we put God to the test by prayer and effort and energy. Do what we are doing, only more so. 
I'm not bragging because we're a Baptist crowd. I've been with all of them. I know what they do. We Baptists are the most evangelistic denomination as a whole this world has ever seen, barring none. You say, what about John Wesley? All right, what about him? You heard he had 120 some odd thousand members in his classes when he left. We've got 13 million. What about it? We have the most perfect soul winning, church building, Sunday school growing organization that any denomination has ever had. Did you know that the Assemblies of God sent the heads of their Sunday school work to Nashville and for three years in a row to find out how the Baptists did it? And then they started growing. We have numbers. We have a good reputation. We have a lot of trained preachers and a lot of dedicated preachers. We have a lot of trained and devoted church members. Now, let's resolve that we're going to let God use us to use all these things in one consistent, prayer-soaked, tear-wetted effort to break through. Let me finish. Some of you have heard me tell it, and many of you have read it. I was in Scotland, across Scotland in meetings, well, across the British Isles. And, oh, I used to think, you know, that when the mayor of a city gives you a kind of a reception and the keys of the city that you, great stuff, out there they do it all the time. They do it to black and white, they do. Just like having an honorary degree, doctorate, I got four of them. Huh. Somebody said they're just like the curl on a pig's tail. They don't amount to a thing. They don't add to a bit of value to the pig. Even a Jew knows that. See, just what are you going to do with a curl on a pig's tail? But anyway, the Lord... Provo, P-R-O-V-O-S-T, mayor of Edinburgh, gave my song there and me a reception, all nice tea and all the rest of it. I told him if I drank one more cup of tea, I'd start speaking English instead of American. Boy, they drown you in tea. Well, he took me around, saw me this, that, and in the guild hall, town hall, there's a room, large room, reception, has paintings of all the Scottish worthies. Well, we were walking around. The man who was leading us, David Laurie, pastor of Carruthers Close, explained them. We came to a painting very large, enormous. And there was a man in bed raised on his elbow, there was a woman, his wife, there, and his daughter, and a man in armor with his visor thrown back. I said, David, I know that picture, but I can't name it. He said, you sure know it. I said, tell me, what is it? He said, that's Bruce. That's Douglas. And he told me. I remember then. Robert Bruce, of course, is a Roman Catholic. He wanted to go to the Crusades, but he fought the English until finally he won liberty, but by the time he won freedom, the, his life was ebbed out. He was tired and old and sick. So on his deathbed, he called his commander-in-chief, Douglas, they called him the Black Douglas. Apparently he was dark. Scottish or sandy-haired, sandy-faced. 
must have had perhaps Spanish blood in him, called him to his bedside and made him promise that when Bruce died, Douglas would have the doctors take Bruce's heart out of his body. And when Douglas went to the Crusades, he was supposed to take Bruce's heart with him. Well, Bruce died. The doctors performed the operation and put his heart, I saw pictures, in a container, kind of large, air-emptied container. Uh, Douglas wrapped it up in Bruce's plaid, you know, the Scottish plaid. And everywhere Douglas went, he carried that heart. If he went to bed, the heart hung from the head of his bed. If he sat down, the heart hung from the chair. If he went out riding, the heart hung from the saddle. Well, peace was won. Douglas organized a troop, mounted knights and infantry to go to the Holy Land fight the Mohammedans for the holy places. They crossed the English Channel into France, down France, crossed, crossed the Pyrenees into Spain when they were attacked by the Moors. The Moors were Mohammedans. There were about 50 Moors or more, more to every one of those Scottish soldiers, knights, and they began to push back the Scots. Where were they to go? Back were the mountains. No way. To the right was the Atlantic. To the left, Moors. In front, Moors. They were through. They were done. They were finished. They gave up. They were ready to quit. And they knew they'd be destroyed, killed, butchered. When Douglas stood up in his saddle, he took his bloody, dripping sword, stuck it in its scabbard. He untied Bruce's plaid with the heart in it from his saddle. They watched him. He raised that heart of Bruce's and swung it around his head and threw it into the ranks of the attacking Moors and cried out, there goes the heart of Bruce. Who follows it? Of course, you know what happened. The Scottish turned around, followed the heart of Bruce, decimated the Moors, and went on to the Holy Land. This is what I'm trying to tell you. Saskatoon, Vancouver, Portland, Eugene, Klamath Falls, Milwaukee, name it. Springfield, Seattle, Tacoma, Everett, Roseburg, name it. Look, see what I'm seeing. The drifting heart of Jesus marking blood along the way, throwing his heart into this great Northwest Territory and saying, there goes my heart. Who will follow it? What do you say? We say to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, you not only died for us, you died for them. You've saved us, you can save them. Remembering what he's done, realizing what needs to be done, resolve in our souls that from this hour on out, intensifying that which you are doing already, go on all out attack, try it for a year. And I promise you by the authority of this holy book, that when you come back next year, there'll be a platform filled with those who have baptized large numbers. Now, if you're willing to say to the Lord this morning, Lord, that preacher told the truth. 
whatever we may have done or not have done in the past, forgive us and give us a new start. We're willing to follow you. Will you stand to your feet? And Lord, I believe in these people. We stand in thy presence and offer thee ourselves with all that we are and all that we have. We pray that thy Holy Spirit will dedicate it to the Lord Christ, to evangelism, to church building, to preaching, to witnessing to the souls of men. Lord, I have pledged thee to these people now come through in power as I believe you will in the Savior's name with thanksgiving. Amen.